This is Matt's 2019 question 1A. Uh, let's go. Um, so this question asks us for the number of real solutions that this cubic has. And I suppose we know a quadratic formula, but we don't know a cubic formula for testing how many roots a cubic equation has. Um, in fact, there is such a formula out there, um, but it's not on A level and it's not on the math specification. Um, it's not something that the question setter was expecting you to know. Um, instead, the question setter was expecting you to draw a picture of this um, equation, to think about this graphically and to work out how many solutions there might be in that with that method. Um, I can say things like that because the question setter was me. Um, okay, so I'm trying to sketch the left hand side here. Um, y is x cubed minus 300x. We could subtract this 3000 as well. Um, I'm choosing to just sketch the left hand side. Um, later I'll sketch y equals 3000 and look for intersection points. Um, so that's going to be some cubic that goes through the origin. Um, and it's a happy cubic like this. Um, positive x cubed coefficient. Um, I think I'd like to find these turning points um, so that I can get an idea of where those uh, important points are on this curve. Um, they happen when x is plus or minus 10. Um, let's plug in 10. Uh, that's 1000 minus 3000 is minus 2000. So this point over here is 10 minus 2000. Um, and there's some symmetry going on, but let's plug in minus 10. Uh, we'll get minus 1,000 plus 3,000. Ah, that, that's plus 2,000. Um, okay, and as promised, I'm going to sketch y equals 3,000 as well and look for points of intersection. So 3,000 is bigger than 2,000, so y equals 3,000 is going to be somewhere over here above this turning point. And from my sketch, I can see there's going to be one solution over here. Uh, I'm not going to pick up a couple of solutions from over here, just, just one solution over here somewhere. I don't know what number that is. Um, somewhere between 10 and infinity, I think. Um, but maybe I can do better than that. But um, there's just going to be one solution. Uh, luckily, the question doesn't ask me for what the solution is. Um, so I just need to select exactly one real solution. Okay, that's Matt 2019, question 1A. Question 1B asks us for the product of a square number and a cube number. So a square number is going to be n squared for some integer n. And a cube number means m cubed for some integer m. Integer m. Okay, and the product will then be n squared m cubed. Okay, the question sort of asks us whether this is always a square number, never a square number, sometimes a square number, and also whether it's always a cube number, never a cube number, sometimes a cube number. Um, these five options are different combinations of those possibilities. So we need to think about whether this is uh, a square number or a cube number or not. Um, I have to say my first impression is that it doesn't look like a square number because it's not obviously the square of a whole number, right? Its square root would be something like n m to the 3 over 2, which is that whole number? I'm not sure. Um, and its cube root would be something involving n to the 2, two thirds. Um, so this doesn't quite look like a square number and a cube number. Um, so I'm, it's probably not going to be e, is it? It's probably not always a cube number and always a square number. My, my choices here are I can try and prove one of these, um, or I can disprove the other ones by finding counterexamples. Um, here, I think. Partly to disprove E, and partly just for experimentation, I'm going to try putting some small numbers in. Um, so if I put in n is 1, m is 1, and check what that product might be, well then I get 1 squared times 1 cubed, which is 1, which actually is a cube number and a square number. So this is looking good for E, it's not a counterexample. Um, I suppose this is a counterexample for D. Um, option D claims that the product would never be a square number, and never be a cube number. Um, so that's out actually because 1 squared times 1 cubed is 1 which is a, technically a square number and a cube number um, all on its own it's a counterexample for both halves of D oh I suppose I can rule out A and B as well because part of the statement in A is that this thing should never be a cube number that's wrong this is sometimes a cube number uh, and B similar statement about squares uh, this is sometimes a square number okay um, so uh, that leaves me with C and E 
is this thing always a cube number and always a square number? Or is it just sometimes a square number and sometimes a cube number? Um, from my only example so far, I can't tell, um, because the example I've got, there uh, it is a square number and a cube number. Okay, I've made this one times one fact go quite a long way. Let's try some other examples. Um, let's try, I like checking small numbers, um, two squared times one cubed is four. Uh, and maybe I'll check, I mean, this is enough on it on its own to say, well, this is still a square number, isn't it? But it's not a cube number. Okay, um, because four is not a cube number. Um, it's not the cube of a whole number. Uh, this is an example to show that E is not true. It, in fact, just for symmetry, I'm going to check what happens when N is 1 and M is 2. Uh, well, that's uh, that's 8, which is not a square. So actually, both halves of E are false. Um, e is two false statements put together. It's not always a cube number, and it's not always a square number. Um, but it is sometimes a square number, and it is sometimes a cube number. So the answer for question 1B is C. Question 1c, um, we're asked for the graph of this horrible looking expression. Um, in particular, it's got lots of trigonometric functions in it, and then there's a plus dot dot dot, um, implying a sort of infinite series or infinite sum here. Um, the only part of the math specification with infinite sums on is geometric um, sums of geometric regressions. Um, so I suppose part of this question is to, is to look at this and think, is this a geometric progression? Um, in fact, it is a geometric progression, and you could do the sum of this geometric progression if you can remember the formula for adding up uh, a geometric regression. I'm going to do the question with a different method, though, um, just to see uh, if I can do it without using that fact. We'll come back to the geometric progression in a, at the end. OK, um, I'm going to check what happens at special values. Um, as if I'm trying to draw the graph myself and I'm trying to think about um, what happens at particular points. Um, so let's find the uh, y-intercept by plugging in x equals 0. Well, when x is 0, sine x is 0. So sine squared and sine to the 4 and sine to the 6, those are all 0. So y is 0 plus 0 plus 0, 0, 0. Um, whatever your geometric series calculation says, this sum is probably 0, isn't it? Um, OK, so not a. This is not through 1, all the others do go through 0. OK, so I've ruled out one of the pictures. Um, what do I want to check next? So I could put in something exciting, like um, x is uh, 45 degrees or something. I know the value of. I know the value when x is 30 degrees. Um, actually, I think I'm going to look at the difference between the pictures to see what a, a good choice to put in might be. Um, B and C look pretty similar. Um, this one's got peaks that go up to 2. This one's got peaks that go up to 1. D is, I suppose, similar in a way. Um, it's got peaks that go higher than 3, and possibly very high, um, off the top of this picture. E is a bit different. It's got some bits with the value of the function being down here, being negative. Is that possible? That seems a bit unlikely. Um, y is the sum of some positive things. I'm pretty sure Y is positive because it's the sum of all these positive things. Um, so I'm going to go with not E, uh, because Y is positive. Um, or 0. Um, OK, so that leaves B, C, and D. Uh, I think the main difference between these pictures is what's going on at X is 90 degrees. Uh, so at 90 degrees, is this sum going to be 1? Is it 2? Is it much bigger than 3? Um, let's find out. Uh, so sine of 90 degrees is 1. Uh, 1 squared is 1. So that's going to be 1 plus, ah, oh, this is also 1. This is also 1, isn't it? Uh, this does not converge. Um, this is, I suppose, a geometric series with common ratio 1, um, which does not converge. Um, or said differently, it's not 1, it's not 2. It's definitely bigger than 2. Um, it's more than 3. <laughs> um, that means that the only correct picture is D, or the only candidate for being a correct picture is D. Um, OK, so that's a way to rule out four of the options leaving D. Let's quickly do the geometric sum. The first term is sine squared x. The common ratio is sine squared x. So this is sine squared over 1 minus sine squared, otherwise known as sine squared over cos squared, um, which is tan squared. Um, so if you got this far, you might think about the picture of 
tan of x and try squaring all the values, um, you'll get a picture that looks like this. Um, and this point at 90 degrees is the sort of vertical asymptote corresponding to the vertical asymptote of tan x. Okay, um, question 1c, the answer is D. Question 1d asks for the area between two parabolas. Um, they've got equations involving a, um, and we're told that that area is 9. So we're looking for possible values of a. And we need to remember in this question that areas are positive. Um, we're going to look for the um, area between uh, these two curves, but we're going to be really careful about uh, which one's above the other. I'll try and draw a picture to show you what I mean. Um, both of these, I've been looking at the equations, both of these go through um, x is 0, y is a, because if I put x is 0 in here, I just pick up the constant term. Um, so let's try and draw those. The first one is a happy quadratic, isn't it? Um, and the second one is an unhappy quadratic, negative x squared coefficient. Um, let's try and put that one in. So if a is positive, then the picture might look like this. Um, a is positive, then the derivative at 0 is positive. Um, so maybe it will look something like um, this. Maybe. Um, OK. Uh, if that's the case, then I want to find this point, I suppose. I've spotted that both of these go through 0, comma a. Um, and then I want to find this point and then work out the area in between by integrating the difference of these curves. Um, if a is negative, then I think the picture is quite similar, but with the area over here. I think if a is negative, then I'll get something like this. Through this point, uh, this one's curving this way, so another, another root over here somewhere. And again, I want to do a minus x squared minus that happy parabola on top. Okay, but maybe I need to be a little bit careful uh, to make sure I'm integrating uh, between this point and zero, oh, whereas over here I'm integrating from zero up to this point. Okay, um, so a being positive or negative seems to make a make a difference perhaps, um, whether this root's on the left or on the right. Let's try and find this, find this root. Um, so when do these parabolas cross each other? Well, that happens when 2x squared plus 2ax is 0, which is x is 0, or divided by 2, x is minus a. Okay, so this is minus a, and here a is negative, so this is minus a, a positive number. Um, okay, what do I want to do? Um, so in this case, this is the a positive case, I want to do something like the integral of the top curve minus the lower curve. Uh, I want to do that integral from minus a up to 0. I want to get 9, um, but I'm going to have to do this integral, aren't I? It's going to be something involving um, a. Um, OK, uh, let's try and integrate this. It's, it's all powers of x, so that's the sort of thing we can integrate. Um, do I want to simplify it first? Um, yes, I do. Also, there's not a squared here. I've copied that out wrong. These a's cancel. Um, I remembered from solving it over here that the a's were supposed to cancel. Um, so this is the integral from minus a up to 0 of minus 2ax minus 2x squared, which I can do as minus ax squared minus 2 thirds x cubed, naught minus a. When I put in 0, I get 0. When I put in minus a, um, I get a minus sign from the lower limit of this integral. I get a minus sign here. I put in the a, I get a cubed. Um, over here, I get minus 2 thirds a cubed. Um, so that's going to be 1 third a cubed. And when I want that to be 9, so that would say a equals 3. Okay, that was one case when, when a was bigger than 0. And I've got a solution a equals 3. Um, very quickly, I think that rules out a, c, or d. Um, leaving me with, uh, I've got to think about, do I want a equals 3 uh, and a equals minus 3, or do I want a equals 3 and a equals 1? Um, I think probably not this one, because I've found when a is positive, I don't want a is 1, I just want a is 3. Um, maybe there could be another negative root. We should do the algebra to work out 
um, whether minus three really is uh, an option. But just from eliminating options, I think I might be done. Okay, um, let's do this integral as well. So here I want to do top curve minus the lower curve again. Uh, and now I'm integrating a as a negative number and I'm integrating from naught up to minus a. Um, so this is the case when a is less than zero. Sorry, my lower limit there is zero. Um, integral sign, there we go. <laughs> um, and if I do that integral again, well, I'm gonna get the same thing for the difference between the curves, same thing for the limits, uh, except my, my limits are the other way around now. Same thing for the integrand, I suppose. Same thing for the integral. Um, but my limits are now the other way around, so I'll get um, minus one third a cubed. And that's equal to 9 when a is minus 3. OK, um, so the answer really is b. Um, a is minus 3 or a is 3. Um, and I had to check very carefully those two cases, a positive or a negative, um, so that I could find both solutions. OK, uh, my answer for question 1d is b. Twenty nineteen question one e. Um, this asks for the graph of sine y minus sine x equals cos squared x minus cos squared y. Um, we're asked whether it's empty, whether there are no points inside uh, this graph, or whether it includes some straight lines. Um, so straight lines would be something of the form y equals mx plus c. It's a bit strange, I suppose, to think about the graph of this containing straight lines. Um, I've seen in a previous math question things looking a bit like this where we, we sketch something like sine y equals sine x. Uh, that contains lots of straight lines um, because it has things like y equals x but also things like y equals x plus 360 degrees or something. Um, so those are two different lines uh, and so on. There are lots of other lines in that picture. Uh, the picture works out to be something like this uh, with lots of lines meeting at right angles. Um, okay, so that's I think what the question is getting at. If you sketched the graph of all of the solutions to this equation, um, would you get any straight lines in that picture? Um, maybe infinitely many, or, or maybe just one or two. Um, so it's quite tempting to use a sort of sine squared fact over here um, to think perhaps um, I could use. I could write these cos squareds in terms of sine squared. In fact, I'm going to do that, I think. That seems like a good enough idea that I'm going to give it a go. Um, I've noticed that the ones are going to cancel. Um, so this is going to be sine squared y minus sine squared x, which is actually pretty good um, because that's the difference of two squares, isn't it? Ah, OK. So included in here, well, now that I factorised the difference of two squares, this includes sine y minus sine x equals zero. Um, that includes all the solutions to sine y equals sine x, which is lots of different lines, right? y equals x, y equals x plus 360 degrees, y is x plus 720 degrees. Um, those are all solutions to this equation. There are also some, some other ones, right? Sine y plus sine x equals one. The, I haven't really thought about. Um, but there's there's all these other solutions as well, when y equals x, or y equals x plus 360 degrees, or y equals x plus 720 degrees. That's lots of solutions. Um, these are each straight lines. I've already found three of them, and in fact I can see this pattern continues. There's going to be infinitely many of these straight lines. Um, a bit like um, previous math questions or thinking about um, sine y equals sine x as a graph has infinitely many straight lines in it. Okay, the answer to question 1e is e. Question 1f asks for this equation, sine cubed x plus cos squared x is zero. We're asked how many solutions this has got. Um, and just like in the previous question I used sine squared plus cos squared equals one, I really want to do that again here to write this in terms of sine x. Um, I suppose I've seen equations like this before where what I really wanted to do was to get everything in terms of sine x, to write u equals sine x, uh, and then stop and think about what, what I'm doing. Um, so I've got down to a cubic equation, u cubed minus u squared plus 1 equals 0. Um, and it's a cubic equation, so I don't automatically know how many roots it's got. 
Um, maybe I should try and draw a picture of this. I suppose sine x is between minus 1 and 1, so I should think about u being just between minus 1 and 1. So I should try and draw a picture of this cubic for those values of u. Um, OK, let's plug in some special values. When u is 0, this is 1. When u is 1, this is 1 minus 1 plus 1 is 1. Uh, when u is minus 1, this is minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 is minus 1. Uh, yes, minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 is minus 1. Um, I suppose I want to find the turning points. Uh, maybe I want to talk about where the turning points are. They're at 3u squared minus 2u um, equals 0, which is u is 0. Uh -huh. um, or u is 2 thirds, uh, which is somewhere in between. Um, so I suppose it's going to come up. Um, it's going to have a turning point here. And then another turning point at u is 2 thirds. Uh, maybe above the axis, maybe above the axis, or maybe below the axis, and then it's going to come back up to one. I'm being cautious because I think the number of solutions here is going to depend on how many roots there are. I'm going to quickly check the value at u equals two thirds. Um, at u equals two thirds, um, I've got u cubed minus u squared plus one. That's equal to um, eight twenty sevenths minus. Um, 4 over 9, I'm going to write as 12 27ths. Um, multiplying top and bottom by 3 to compare it to this, plus 27 over 27, um, which is, oh, it's, it's bigger than 0, isn't it? Because that's, uh, this bit's bigger than 0 plus 8. It's bigger than 0. Okay. So no more solutions over here. Um, this turning point is somewhere above the x axis. Um, so all I've got for solutions to u, u cubed minus u squared plus 1 equals 0. Um, is this solution over here. I don't know what this number is. This is a bit like question 1a, where I'm looking for solutions of a cubic. Um, I don't know what it is, but by the sign change rule, I suppose, um, this, it's negative over here and it's positive over here. So somewhere in between, there's a solution. Um, OK, so we've got one negative value of u, which was sine x. It's very easy to get excited at this point, circle one value and move on but actually let's be careful because when you're solving equations like sine x equals number you've got to think about the, the range of x haven't we um, x is somewhere between naught and 360 degrees um, so we've got this negative value of sine x it's bigger than minus one um, there's actually going to be two values of x that give that value of sine x um, so here, u is some negative number, two different values of x that corresponds to that value of sine x. Um, so the answer is c, two solutions um, to this equation in that range of x. Okay, question 1g, we're given three equations and asked whether they have a unique solution, whether they have no solutions. Um, or whether something more complicated is going on. Um, let's break down the options. Um, the equations themselves involve logarithms and we're going to get there when we get there. Let's think about what each of these options really means. Um, option A says that the equations specify A, B and C uniquely. Um, that would be the case if we solved these equations and got out a solution like A equals one half, B equals three, C is the only root of x cubed minus 300x is 3000. Um, that would be a unique solution. Um, but it might be the case that these equations don't have a unique solution. Um, you've seen this before for things like quadratic equations where there's more than one solution. Um, options B, C and D are trying to describe something a bit more complicated where maybe part of the solution is specified uniquely, um, that we can solve these equations for some of the variables uniquely, um, but then there's infinitely many possibilities for the other variables. Um, this would be the case if the equations, I haven't looked at them yet, but if the equations were something like a plus 1 equals 2, b equals b, um, then those equations would have a unique solution for a, um, but infinitely many solutions for b, because anything works, and also infinitely many solutions for c, because there's no constraints on c from this system of equations. Um, in fact, the equations aren't that, and they, they don't simplify to become that either. 
Um, but that's, that's what I mean. That, that, that it might be the case that we can solve for some of the variables uniquely, um, but have lots of possibilities left over from the other variables. Uh, and option E says there's no solution for A, B, and C. Um, that would be the case if these equations are somehow inconsistent and there's, there's no numbers that work in all three of these equations at the same time. Um, you've seen this for uh, things like quadratics with no roots before. Um, okay, let's look at the equations now. Ugh, they all involve logarithms, logarithms with different bases, A, B, and C. We're told that A, B, and C are bigger than zero. Um, I suppose we probably also want A, B, and C to be not one, um, because if one of these is one, then we're doing logarithm base one, um, and logarithm base one just doesn't work. If you're going to do logarithms, you need the thing uh, in the base to be to not be one. Um, I'll talk about more about that later on in the question. Um, okay, um, so we're going to take some logarithms. The numbers are positive. Um, and I think the first thing I want to do is get rid of all of the logarithms. Um, so I'm going to raise each side of this equation, um, uh, raise it, raise a to the power of each side of this equation to get rid of that logarithm. Uh, I'm going to do a similar thing over here with b, raising b to the power of each side of this equation. And over here, I'm going to do a is c to the b. Okay. Um, the, these three equations are quite complicated. I suppose the first and the third one look quite nice. The middle one's got this 3 over 2 in the power, which is a bit strange. Um, usually when I'm solving equations like this, I'm trying to eliminate uh, variables and combine them together to build a solution. Um, here, um, I've got to pick which equation I want to plug into one of the others. Um, so I've got an expression for a, I've got a, another expression for a, and I've got, another exp I've got an expression for b. Um, and it's up to me how I plug those together. Okay, so I'm going to take the first one, that's an expression for b, and I'm going to plug it into here. I'm thinking about how these have got the same numbers downstairs, a and b, so I'm hoping to um, relate those together. This one involves c downstairs, so it's a little bit different from the other two. So I'm going to take this one and try and plug in the value of b. Um, so I'll get a over here is this, this b, I'm going to replace with an a to the c. And it's that to the power of c plus 3 over 2, which is a is equal to a to the c, c plus 3 over 2. Um, this is pretty good. This left-hand side is a to the 1. This right-hand side is a to the something else. Um, because a is not 1, so I can write 1 is c times c plus 3 over 2. Um, if a was 1, then you could have different... Uh, indices and different powers of one can be equal to each other but if a is not one then the only way to have these powers agreeing is to have the same ind index upside. Um, I'm taking a logarithm base a on each side which is only possible if a is not one um, which is not so that this question makes sense. More on that in a minute. Um, okay I've got an equation now um, it's uh, zero is uh, multiply, by, multiply through by two. Um, two 2c squared plus 3c minus 2. Quadratic equation, I can relax. I know how to solve quadratic equa equations. Do I know how to say quadratic equation? Um, so that's going to be plus 2 to get 4c minus 1. Um, so c is 1 half or c is minus 2. Um, and I was told right at the start that c was positive. Um, so I'm going to do ignore c being minus 2 and just say c is 1 half. Okay, this is pretty good. We found a solution for c. Um, might still be the case that um, we have infinitely many solutions for A and B, like in option B. Um, it might be the case that there's no solutions for A and B, in which case I think we pick option E. Um, or it might be a unique solution for A, B and C. So it could still be option A. Okay, let's take our value of C and plug it into the equations. So now we've got B is A to the 1 half. A equals B squared. Ah, those, luckily, th these look quite similar, don't they? Um, and a is one half to the b. Okay, um, so we've used these two together, that's why they now look really similar. Um, we haven't thought about this equation yet, which now says a is one half to the b. Um, I could plug in this value of b over here to get a is one half to the a to the one half, and then think about a equals one half to the a to the one half and how many solutions it's got. Um, or I could take this expression for a and plug it in on the left. Um, so there's a choice there, 
um, I think this gives a nicer equation, uh, one that I can think about. Um, I don't know any solutions to this equation. Um, zero is not a solution, one is not a solution, two is not a solution. Um, but if I draw a graph of b squared and one half to the b, so one half to the b starts at one and decays like this uh, with b, um, then there's going to be exactly one solution in between. b squared is increasing, one half to the b starts at one, but then it's decreasing. There's going to be exactly one solution. So a bit like question 1a, um, there's going to be a solution here. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I know there's going to be one solution for b. Um, and I'm also know b, a is equal to b squared, so that's going to give me one solution for a. Once I've worked out b from if I could solve this, I'm not asked to actually work out the values, but if I could solve this and work out the number, that would be a unique solution for b, and then I'd square it to get my corresponding value of a. Um, so overall, this has a unique solution. Um, this specifies a, b, and c uniquely. Um, I know the value of c. I don't know uh, the exact value of b and a, uh, but I know it's unique. Um, okay, um, just like in question 1a, I didn't know the exact value, um, but I could see that it was unique. Um, let's talk about log 1 a little bit more. Um, so some people are more happy with log base 1. Um, you could have things like... a uh, so let's let's explore what happens if a equals one. If we allow a to be one, then solving this one, I've got a to the something on here, so b should probably be one as well. Um, and over here, I've got um, and once b is one, this says a equals c, so c is also one. Uh, so if a is one, then you probably want b is one and c is one as well. Then if you go back and check that in your original equations, so maybe I should take this and go and check it. But let's check that back in the original equations. And they read log 1, 1 is 1, log 1, 1 is uh, 5 over 2, and log 1, 1 is 1. Um, it's a little bit dubious what the value of log 1, 1 is. Um, I personally don't think log 1 is defined at all. I don't think any of these mean any number. Um, even if you've got some definition of what log 1, 1 might be, um, you can't have it being equal to 1 and equal to 5 over 2. Um, th that's not a function. Um, so even if you come up with some definition of what log base 1 is, um, if it's a function, it's not going to do this. Um, okay. Right, so 1 doesn't get you anywhere. You need to take a to be not 1 and then do algebra a bit like this, I suppose. Okay. Question 1h is um, a question that I wrote about a right angled triangle with the sides in geometric progression. Um, so that means that the sides are numbers a, ar, ar squared. Um, okay. And I suppose that if r is, it could be one of those geometric progressions where the sides get um, larger or where the numbers get smaller. Um, either way round, we want the largest side to be um, we want the largest side to be on the hypotenuse. So let's put a r squared. Let's say r is bigger than one, um, and put a r squared on the hypotenuse. Um, if that's not the case, then we can actually relabel what r is. We can if r is <laughs> if r is less than one, and this is a geometric series where the sides get smaller. This one is one of the small sides. A will be on the hypotenuse. And then we could switch the order around to write ar squared ar a, which is a geometric series with common ratio 1 over r, which would then be bigger than 1. So without loss of generality, we say r is bigger than 1. Um, I think most people, when they saw this, didn't worry about whether r was bigger than 1 or not. Usually your geometric series that you write down have terms going bigger, maybe. Um, so you might write down ar squared on the hypotenuse. Um, hopefully that didn't worry people too much. Um, so we've got a triangle like this. Um, we're asked for tan BAC, um, so which corner is which? Right angled at B, um, so I suppose the other two corners this. Um, I suppose they might be this way around, or A and AR are kind of different, aren't they? Or it might be the case that it's this way around. So I do need to be a little bit careful about which side is which. Um, I might have them this way around, in which case I'm asked for tan BAC. 
this angle, um, or yeah, or this angle, but this is a different triangle because the sides have been switched. Um, okay, um, what am I going to do? Um, there's lots of square roots in here. I've got three sides of a right angled triangle. I'm probably going to use Pythagoras. Um, Pythagoras says that for either, either of these pictures, a squared plus a squared r squared is equal to a squared r to the 4. Um, the a's cancel out. Um, I suppose a is not 0, otherwise this is not much of a triangle. Um, all of its sides are 0. Um, so 1 plus r squared is r to the 4. Um, this is a quadratic. Um, for r squared with solutions, r squared is 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of a funny thing going on in this question that one of the options now is to say r is plus or minus 1 plus root 5 over 2 um, r you see is tan theta in this picture which is tan angle BAC so we're looking for r um, we're asked for tan of that angle over here tan theta is 1 over r um, so there's a sort of trap in the question to get this far in the algebra and say, aha, r is plus or minus this, um, r, r squared is this number, so I should take the plus or minus sign and then take the square root, that will give me a. Um, in fact, that doesn't work because 1 minus root 5 uh, is less than 0. Um, so this is not okay to be inside this square root. Um, these are positive numbers, not complex numbers. Um, so we should probably take the plus root here, say so r squared is 1 plus root 5 over 2. Um, and then there's another trap to say, ah, so I should take r is plus or minus root 1 plus root 5 over 2, um, because you know I've got two roots from this square, square root I'm about to do. Um, that's option d, but actually these side lengths are positive, so we, we don't want this negative side length. Um, so really we want r to be root 1 plus root 5 over 2. We only get one solution for r that's, that's positive and real. Um, the real reason that there's two possibilities is this reason that the sides could be this way around or the sides could be this way around. Um, that tan theta could be r or it could be 1 over r. Um, so my solution is r is this single number, but tan theta could be root 1 plus root 5 over 2 or 2 over 1 plus root 5 square rooted. Okay, we need to do a tiny bit of algebra to simplify this. Um, maybe it's not a surprise that the, the simplified um, simplified version of this um, doesn't involve square root of 3 at all. Um, if you multiply top and bottom by root, root, root 5 minus 1 inside the square root, uh, then you get 2 root 5 minus 2 on the top, and you get uh, root 5 is 5 minus 1, uh, 4 downstairs, um, which is then going to be equal to root 5 minus 1 over 2, this, inside the square root. Um, so the answer is C, uh, and these two different solutions come not from this square, and not from this square, but from the fact there's two different pictures that you can draw with the sides uh, labelled A, B, C. Uh, or CBA. Okay, that's question 1H. Question 1I asks for a number of solutions to an equation again. Um, we're looking at the equation x2 to the x equals y2 to the y. Um, so I suppose this is solved by x equals y. Um, if we didn't have these restrictions, I could say um, the solutions to this include uh, solutions include x equals y. Um, 1 times 2 to the 1 is the same thing as 1 times 2 to the 1. 3 times 2 to the 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2 to the 3. I think you get the point. Um, those are both 24. Um, unfortunately, the question says x is supposed to be less than y. Um, so we can't use any of these solutions. Um, the question wants us to say, are there any solutions with y actually bigger than x, where x 2 to the x takes the same value as y 2 to the y? Um, we're asked for the number of solutions in terms of the, the pairs of x and y. Um, so this is counting whether there might be a pair, um, one, so might be counting pairs of x and y as separate objects. Um, so that if these were both solutions, you'd count that as, that's two pairs of 
two pairs x, y. In fact, neither of those are solutions uh, because one two to the one is not the same as two times two to the two. Um, in fact, after you've played with some examples a bit um, of this, you, you might spot that it feels like the right-hand side is always bigger. Um, that's in fact true. X is less than Y, so 2 to the X is less than 2 to the Y. Those things are... Uh, 2 to the X is increasing, I suppose. So 2 to the Y would be bigger than 2 to the X if Y is bigger than X. Um, and also, if you multiply two things, Y is bigger than X, 2 to the Y is bigger than 2 to the X. So this, this thing on the right is just the product of two bigger things. Um, if you multiply two small things together, you get something smaller than if you multiply two big things together. Um, so these things can't be equal. The left-hand side is always smaller than the right-hand side. Um, so that means there are no pairs x and y that actually satisfy this equation if we're told x has to be less than y. Okay. Uh, sort of infinitely many if we include x equals y, but the question has banned x equals y. Okay, that's question 1i. Question 1j asks about an equilateral triangle um, with centre O and side length 1. We're asked to consider what happens when a straight line is drawn through O. It meets the triangle at points P and Q, and we'd like to make the line PQ as small as possible. So there's this uh, possibility that this line could be at some sort of angle. Uh, maybe if I call that... So if I drop a perpendicular here and call that theta or something, um, we're trying to make the whole length PQ here as small as possible. Um, and that's a little bit tricky to imagine because as uh, the line rotates, um, the points where it intersects this triangle are going to move around a bit. Um, it's very tempting to write down kind of equations for where they are and maybe try and bring some calculus in. That makes the question really difficult. Um, I like to think about this in terms of what happens at special values of theta. So when theta equals zero, in my picture, with theta there being the angle between OQ and a perpendicular from O to the bottom of the triangle, if theta is zero, that's the line straight down through, uh, through that point at the bottom and the top of the triangle. Um, that line has, well, I suppose some length, doesn't it? Um, the side length is one. This is a triangle with 60 degree angles in, so this height will be root three over two. So this is this is an example of what that line PQ might be. Um, the trick is I'm gonna change the value of theta. I'm gonna think about other special values of theta. Um, I suppose as I start rotating that line, I will eventually get around to a point where it's gone through this corner instead. Uh, I wonder what that angle is. Um, so um, let me draw some more perpendiculars in. I'm not sure that's quite clear yet. Um, this, if I draw another perpendicular in, that would be one third of the circle, wouldn't it? Um, so I think this is 60 degrees. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, 60 degrees because it's... Um, one sixth of 360 degrees. I could draw in a kind of picture like this, um, dropping every, dropping in loads of perpendiculars, one sixth of the circle. Yeah, at 60 degrees, um, I'm going through this corner instead. So P and Q have moved a bit, uh, but this will still be root three over two, which has started to make me think that maybe the diameter is always root three over two, but that's not actually the case. Um, triangles don't have constant diameter. Um, circles have constant diameter, but this triangle is not a circle. Hmm, that was cleverer in my head. Right, okay, this triangle's not a circle, or a really triangle, um, so we're going to, it doesn't have a constant diameter. Okay, um, somewhere in between then, maybe it takes uh, larger values or smaller values. It's kind of tempting to put in some other values. Um, let's think a little bit about what that length PQ is. I, I suppose it's the length OP plus the length OQ. Um, so the length OQ, if I had to draw a graph of it, I'd say, well, it's something, isn't it, to start off with. Uh, and then as you increase theta from 0 up to 60 degrees, that's 0 down here, let's have 60 degrees over here. Um, as you increase um, theta, it gets larger, like this. 
Um, after 60 degrees, something different happens. But after 60 degrees, I think this picture repeats again, right? Because it's gone through a point of the triangle. This is all the same picture, but rotated around a bit. After here, it's going to repeat um, a sequence of what the distance PQ is as I rotate around until I get through to uh, a line going through this point and the mid midpoint over there. I sort of, I don't want to consider all of the possibilities of rotated rotated pictures, just rotated triangles or rotated lines. Um, okay, so that's the length of OQ, um, and then for the length of OP, I suppose I could drop a perpendicular over here. Now, what have I got? Um, I think I'd like to think about this angle over here. Wow, what do I know? Um, I know that um, this is uh, one third of a triangle, I think. This is one third of a circle, it's 120 degrees. So I think this in here, this little angle in my picture, is I think 60 degrees minus theta to make the, the angles on a straight line join up. You wouldn't know it, but PQ is supposed to be a straight line. Okay, so I think that means that OP, if I had to draw a graph of it, is um, the reflection of, of this picture of OQ between naught and 60 degrees. Um, because as I increase theta, I'm decreasing 60 minus theta. I'm decreasing it from 60 down, okay. Um, so this is going to be something, uh, when P is right up at the top of the triangle, it's going to be some high number, and it's going to come down to some low number when theta is 60 degrees, and OP is nice and short. So the, the challenge is that I've got an increasing function, OQ, as I increase theta, and a decreasing function of theta, OP, um, as I uh, decrease, as I increase theta, then I, I decrease OP. P gets closer to the centre as Q gets further away. If I draw both pitch, both lines on the same axes, I get something like this. And I suppose I'm interested in the sum of those functions, um, which is going to be something like this, isn't it? Interested in the sum of those um, sum of those lengths because I want OP plus OQ. Um, and I think the sum of those lengths, it's pretty clear. I think that it's going to have a minimum in the middle, um, halfway in between zero and sixty degrees. Um, there's going to be some minimum of that length halfway in between. Okay. Possibly, and uh, I don't think this is the case, but it's possible that it could have a more complicated shape, but actually I think these uh, expressions that I haven't worked out for OP and OQ are actually quite nice. And uh, There's not other minimum going on, so it's not, not a trick like that. Okay, um, so I think 30 degrees. There's a sort of question now, I actually need to find the length of PQ with my angle of 30 degrees. Um, 30 degrees is quite nice because, hang on a minute, wasn't, this is 30 degrees as well. Um, so these lines are parallel. And I've got um, a line through the center that's parallel to one of the sides. So I just need to work out how long is that side length um, if, the, if it's parallel to one of the sides. Let's draw a picture. Maybe it'd be more helpful to draw this picture with the side parallel to the bottom of the triangle. Now I've rotated the picture a bit. Um, okay, this is the middle of the triangle, so there's some length, I don't know what it is yet, um, from the middle to each of the corners. Um, I suppose I know, I know the side length of the triangle is one, so this is one half. Um, so if I'm concentrating, I could write down x is equal to, I suppose, um, one half over do I want this? One half over root three over two, so one over root three. One over root three. Um, and this thing over here is going to be, oh, sorry, uh, x, is going to, x is going to be one over root three by trigonometry. Um, and then I've got one over root three. This bit over here, there's a 60 degree angle here. This is x over two, so this is half of one over root three. Um, so I think this line sort of similar triangles with some parallel lines over here. I think this line is two thirds of the length of the bottom of the triangle because it's x over x plus x and a half. Um, I've used a little 30, 60, 30, 60, 90 triangle down here to get this x over two. And then this height of this top triangle is x compared to three x over, uh, three x over two for the height of the whole triangle. That's two thirds, um, two thirds of the total, um, yeah, two thirds of the base of the triangle, which is one. Okay, do that, so my answer is D.
Okay, question one J, D. Okay, question two. Um, we're given some polynomials where x is the input variable and k is sort of counting the polynomials or keeping track of this sequence of polynomials. Um, pk means multiply together these brackets, 1 plus x, 1 plus x squared, 1 plus x cubed, up to 1 plus x to the k. Um, and if you were to multiply, all out, multiply out all of those brackets, you'll get some expression for the polynomial. Uh, with coefficients a0, a1, a2, up to an. Um, luckily, we're not going to actually do that multiplication out. That sounds like far too much work. Part one of the question wants us to say what the degree of this polynomial is. Um, and luckily, the degree is the same on each side of this equation. So I can think about the degree of this product on the left. The degree is the highest power of x. Um, so the highest power of x will come from choosing x here, then x squared, x cubed, all the way up to x to the k. So that'll be x times x squared times x cubed times x to the 4 times dot 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 times x to the k. That power is laws of indices 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus all the way up to k, which is exactly k times k plus 1 over 2, that's an arithmetic progression. Um, okay, so that's what the value of n is, because that's the uh, highest power of x that we get. Part 2 suggests that we set x equal to 1, and it asks us about the maximum of these coefficients on the right. I'll, I'll think about that in a minute. I want to set x equal to 1. So I'll work out pk of 1. Um, that's going to be, well, the first bracket here is 2, the second bracket is 2, and I suppose all of these brackets are 2, and there's k of them. Um, so that's going to be 2 to the k on the left. And on the right, it's going to be a0 plus a1 plus a n, if I set x to 1 everywhere I see an x. Okay, um, so that's a true statement, that 2 to the k is equal to the sum of these coefficients. It's not the statement I'm asked for, um, but it is a kind of interesting fact that the sum of those coefficients, I really don't want to work out what they are, but they add up to 2 to the k. Okay, we're actually asked about the largest coefficient. We're not told which one it is. I'm not really sure which one it is. I think it's probably one of the middle ones, um, but I, I'm not sure. Um, we're asked um, to show that 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 uh, term is big, uh, that this sum somehow involves a really large term. Um, what can I actually say? Um, so I suppose this sum of all of them, I don't know which one is the biggest. I, I want to write down something involving a max. Um, I suppose they could all be equal, um, or a kind of upper bound on how big this sum is would be if all m plus 1 of them, there are m plus 1 because there's this a0 as well, um, if all m plus 1 of them were equal to the biggest one, a max, um, that was the biggest that this sum could possibly be. Okay, so I've written down a true statement now that this sum is at most what it would be if every term was equal to the biggest term by definition. Okay, um, I can rearrange that by dividing by m plus 1 to get that 2 to the k over n plus 1 is less than or equal to a max. Okay. Uh, part 3 asks us to think about what happens um, as k increases, explain why ai eventually becomes constant, or event is eventually is eventually fixed, I suppose that means, um, as k increases a bit more. And I suppose we should think about what happens as we go from pk of x... Uh, up to the next one. So as k increases is making me think about what happens when you increase k. Well, you go all the way up to now being up to 1 plus x to the k plus 1 in on the yeah, inside these brackets on the left. Um, so that is exactly this thing over here is pk of x times 1 plus x to the k plus 1. Okay, when you multiply out polynomials like that, you'll get all of the coefficients from pkx multiplied by 1, so 
that, that's nice. And then also you'll get the whole polynomial pk of x multiplied by x to the k plus 1. If k is big, then x to the k plus 1 is a huge power of x um, that means that, um, in particular, if k is bigger than i, so if k is bigger than i, then pk plus 1 of x, or pk of x, I suppose, is 1 plus x to the k times pk minus 1 of x. Um, so we've multiplied it by 1 plus x to the k. Um, this term can't give... Uh, this term can't give any x to the i stuff. Um, can't give any contribution to the x to the i coefficient because it's already too many x's multiplied together. Um, so no matter which term you choose from pk minus 1 to multiply it with, um, you can't get any xi. So the term, uh, the coefficient ai doesn't change. It's the same as it was for, for pk minus 1 um, because... I suppose I'll get that coefficient from the 1 and I'll get no more contribution from this x to the k. Okay, so the ai there uh, will stay the same as I multiply by 1 plus x to the k once k is big enough. In the middle of this question, we're told that someone else has gone and worked out p6 of x. I'm glad that we didn't have to do this. Look, they've correctly calculated all of these terms. 1, 1, 1, 2, 2 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, 5. 4, 4, 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1. Amazing. Um, and they've guessed that ai is equal to an minus i, which I suppose means that a0 is equal to an, a1 is equal to an minus 1, a2 is equal to an minus 2, um, and so on and so on and so on. Um, we're going to prove that this is correct by substituting 1 over x for x. Um, so if I go back to that original expression... And I think about pk of 1 over x. Well, that's 1 plus 1 over x plus 1 plus 1 over x squared times, oh, sorry, times 1 plus 1 over x cubed times 1 plus 1 over x to the k. That's just what pk of 1 over x means. Um, but it's also going to be equal to a0 plus a1 1 over x plus a2 1 over x squared plus dot 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 plus a n 1 over x to the n, big N, um, because that's what get what you get if you plug in 1 over x on the right-hand side. Okay, um, I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to try and sort out all of these brackets. I'm going to multiply, I suppose, I want to multiply both sides by x, I want to multiply both sides by x squared, x cubed, x to the 4. Hang on a minute, I've seen that sum already. I want to multiply both sides by x to the n. So multiply both sides by x to the n, and that will make this sum on the left into x plus 1 plus x, x plus 1 times x squared plus 1 times x cubed plus 1 times dot 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 times x to the k plus 1, which is exactly pk of x. Um, so that's exactly a0 plus a1x plus dot 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 plus a n x to the n on the left. And on the right, we'll get a0, something more interesting, a0 x to the n plus a1, when I multiply this by x to the n, I'll get x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a n. Okay, so now compare coefficients. And if we compare coefficients, we'll find that the constant coefficient a0 is equal to the constant in this expression on the right hand side, which is a big N. Um, the terms are kind of written backwards on the right hand side. So then we'll have a1 is equal to a n minus 1, uh, and so on, working backwards um, until we get down to a naught is equal to a n again, I suppose. Um, brilliant. Okay, so that's why these coefficients were like this. Um, if you substitute 1 over x into this fact that we had before, um, definition of what the coefficients are, um, then multiplying through by x to the n gives us, on the one hand, uh, the same thing we started with, and on the other hand, it gives us this new expression with the coefficients written backwards. Okay, um, part five is the last part of the question and wants us to think about this guess. So here, a max is five, and the students notice that the numbers one, two, three, four, and five all appear. Um, we're told to use part two that's that a max is big, it's bigger than 
uh, 2 to the k over n plus 1 um, to show that in this case the student is wrong. Um, okay, so the students guess this happens for all positive integers k, which I suppose is going to be their problem, uh, that rather than just guessing this for p6 where it's true, they guess this for all k. Um, so we could go and work out some other polynomials like p7 or p8, but I really don't want to work them out. Um, we're going to use part two instead to show that the student is wrong eventually. Okay, I suppose this inequality, if I had to put it in words, it says a max is really big. Um, it, it's bigger than two to the k, which is huge, right? Uh, two to the k, the thing grows exponentially. A max is really big uh, for large k. Um, so for large k, let's try and put that into very rough words. For large k, a max is, quotes, really big. Um, because it's, I think, going to be so big that there's no way to get all of these coefficients. Uh, that's my kind of guess. Um, so, number of, I'm trying to prove the student wrong, right? So I'm trying to prove the student wrong. So I'm trying to show you that it's eventually impossible to have all of the numbers. So the number of coefficients uh, is n plus one which I'm going to claim is sort of really small. Um, and I'm going to try and put maths into that um, to say that a max is really big and the number of coefficients is, is really small, so there's no way to have all of the possible numbers represented among these coefficients. That's my idea. Uh, so no way to have all the coefficients, uh, sorry, all the numbers a naught dot 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 a max, sorry, excuse me, one up to a max, all of the numbers uh, in the coefficients. Too many numbers, not enough coefficients. Let's try and put some uh, maths on this. A max is really big. It's bigger than two to the k over n plus one. n plus one. Well, I suppose that's not really small. That's just only quite big. So maybe I need to refine this to be smaller. Uh, n plus one. So I need to prove that. Oh, so I want to prove, want to prove that two to the k over n plus one, eventually. I think that's eventually bigger than n plus one. Um, now two, I could think instead about two to the k. Is the fight I could set up? I could think about two to the k versus n plus one squared. Um, n plus 1 squared is something like k, uh, k, k plus 1 over 2 squared. So there's some sort of quartic in k. Um, exponentials grow faster than quartics. Exponentials get much bigger than polynomials. Um, so I think I'd quote something like exponentials get bigger than polynomials. Um, eventually, um, to say that eventually 2 to the k is really big, um, this coefficient a max is really big, um, much bigger than the number of coefficients I've got, so I can't have all of the numbers appearing amongst the coefficients. And that's question two. Question three, um, so we're given a parabola, x minus a times b minus x, and a straight line y equals mx. Um, but first we're told to work out this integral. This is the integral of some polynomials. So we can do this, it's not too bad, minus x cubed over three between naught and c. Uh, that's gonna be c cubed over two minus c cubed over three, which is exactly c cubed over six. Um, without further calculation, uh, we're going to explain why this area is b minus a cubed over 6, um, suspiciously something cubed over 6, um, and it's because this parabola is what you get if you translate this thing we've just integrated to the right by a units and set c equal to b minus a. Uh, so that the root at C 
has been translated to B. Okay, so translating that area along preserves that area, so the area now will still be C cubed over 6, which, because I've set C to be B minus A, is B minus A cubed over 6. That's the area of S. Okay. Part 2 tells us that this line y equals mx meets the parabola tangentially, um, as shown in the diagram. We're asked to find the value of m, uh, which is, we're going to show, root b minus root a squared. Okay, um, I think the best way to show that two things are tangent is to show that there's a repeated root um, between them. If they're polynomials, then you can find things like repeated roots. Um, so let's write out this quadratic. Um, um, I want this... I want a repeated root uh, in this difference between those difference between those curves uh, in this expression. So when I look for when I look for points of intersection, I want to find a repeated root. Uh, multiplying out this quadratic gives me ax. There's a bx. There's a minus ab. There's a lot of minus signs going on in here. Minus mx equals zero. Um, that's a quadratic. I know when quadrat quadratics have repeated roots, it's when b squared minus 4ac, the discriminant is 0. Um, here, the discriminant is this. This is my discriminant. Um, a plus b minus m, that's my x coefficient, squared minus 4 times minus 1 times minus ab um, is minus 4ab. So if that is 0, then I get a repeated root. Okay, let's try and solve this for m. m only appears once, so it's not too bad. Um, I think if I solve this, I'll get m is a plus b plus or minus the square root of 2 root ab. Okay, and I need to think a little bit about whether I want the plus root or the minus root. Um, I suppose there's two solutions because there's another value of m that works, as well as the one shown in this picture. If we continue this parabola off down here, then there's another value of m that's steeper and meets the parabola way down here somewhere um, over where the parabola is negative. Um, I don't want that one, so I don't want the don't want the plus sign because that meets the meets the parabola in the wrong place uh, where this thing is negative. Um, and then final thing to note is that this expression is actually root a minus root b squared, sort of in disguise. Um, and I'm not sure I would have spotted that, um, but luckily they tell me that m is equal to that. Or that, so square of minus thing is the same as square of thing. Hmm, hang on, this is also equal to root b minus root a squared. There we go, square of minus x is the same as square of x. Okay, m is equal to this number here. Okay. Now we're told that a is 1 and b, we're going to rewrite it as beta squared, where beta is bigger than 1. Okay, I guess b was bigger than a to start off with, so that makes sense to me. Um, we're told the area of r. What was r? Oh, it's this bit over here. Um, okay, so glad we didn't have to work that one out. We're told the value of r is this in terms of beta. We're asked to show that it's equal to the area of s when this expression holds. So I'm going to write down the area of s. So I want, I suppose... 2 beta plus 1 times beta minus 1 squared over 6. I want that to be equal to the area of S, which was b minus a, b is beta squared, a is 1, cubed over 6. Okay, difference of two squares on this, beta squared minus 1 cubed is um, beta minus 1 cubed, beta plus 1 cubed over 6. Okay. I've noticed there's some beta minus 1s in here and beta minus 1s in here. Okay, let's rearrange this expression. I'm going to move everything onto the left. Uh, now I'm going to move everything onto the right. Um, and I'm going to multiply both sides by 6 uh, and take out a factor of beta minus 1 squared. Okay, so that will leave me with um, another beta minus 1 uh, and two more, no, two or three more beta plus 1 cubed, um, okay, so beta plus 1 cubed uh, times beta minus 1, uh, and I'll need to subtract off this 2 beta plus 1, 
Okay, so that'll give me 0 equals beta minus 1 squared times some stuff. Let's think about this term here. Um, I might stick together one of the beta plus 1 squared and then stick a beta plus 1 back together with a beta minus 1 to get beta squared minus 1. That feels quite nice. Um, that is going to be, if I multiply that out, beta squared plus 2 beta plus 1 multiplied by beta squared minus 1 is going to be beta to the 4. And I get a pick up of 2 beta to the cubed. Um, I get beta squared, but then I get minus beta squared. Um, I get minus 2 beta and I get minus 1. And then if I subtract another 2 beta and another 1, then I get exactly this quartic in the bracket here. So I won't write it out. Um, finish off simplifying this and you get exactly this expression. We're asked to explain why there is a solution uh, to this equation, star, um, in the range beta bigger than 1. And I suppose I could go and try and spot a solution of this equation. I don't fancy my chances of that. Um, I suppose when beta is bigger than 1, this thing is uh, positive. Well, no, it's positive anyway, isn't it? Because it's squared. <laughs> um, this is some positive thing. So this is not 0. Um, so, I mean, that's 0 when beta is 1. If beta is bigger than 1, then this is sort of not interesting. I'd need to find a solution to this quartic equals 0. Um, so what do I want? I want b to the 4 plus 2 b to cubed minus 4 beta minus 2 equals 0. I can't see a root of it. 1, I'm not allowed to use. 2 doesn't work because 16 plus 16 is 32. Take away 8, take away 2 is 22, which is too big. Um, maybe if I put in um, beta, yeah, hang on. If beta is about 1, if I put in beta just a little bit more than 1, I want to try and imagine whether this is um, bigger than 0 or less than 0. Um, I'm looking for a sign change. If beta is about 1, then this thing on the left is about 1 plus 2 minus 4 minus 2 um, is minus 3. Okay, if I put in 2, it's really big, right? Uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, and another 16 is 32, take off 8, take off 2 is, yeah, 22. Um, so when beta is 2, if beta is 2, this is 22. Um, so somewhere in between, I'm sorry, in between, must be 0. Um, there's a sign change there from about minus 3 to 22. Um, and OK. Um, I'm not supposed to put in beta actually equal to 1. Um, I'm supposed to look at beta bigger than 1. But there's a sign change in that polynomial between 1 and 22. So somewhere bigger than 1 and less than 20, less than bigger than 1 and less than 2, uh, there's, a, there's a value of beta that gives me exactly 0 for that quartic. That's the solution. That's what I'm looking for. OK, final part of the question is just an extra part to say, without further calculation, deduce that for any a bigger than 0, so not just 1, but any a bigger than 0, there exists a, some b bigger than a, some perfect solution, such that the area of S equals the area of the region R. This is checking whether we understand that up here we were saying, um, I want the areas R and S to be equal. Um, and in that special case, a equals 1, then I can find some value of beta. So I can find some value of b. So we're done. If a is 1, we're done. Um, by the stuff we just did. Um, if A is 1, then we found the perfect value of beta, which gives us the perfect value of B, um, to put in so that the area of S matches the area of R. Um, if not, then rescale um, is the final idea we need here. If not, then rescale everything. Um, stretch the picture. So go back to your original picture. Um, let's just tidy this up. So if I go back to the original picture, uh, and I imagine stretching the solution from uh, the, the quadratic with roots at 1 and beta squared to stretch that out, now the areas will stay the same under stretch. The areas will stay equal to each other as I stretch. And as I stretch, I can move the first root to wherever I want it to be. Um, so if I take the first solution and I stretch by a factor of 2, then I can move a to 2. Beta moves to somewhere else, but cool, it's still a, it's still a solution for that point over there. It's just been stretched out by a factor of 2. Um, actually, to keep 
To keep the line y equals mx having the right gradient, I should stretch everything upwards as well um, by some amount. So I should make sure I stretch upwards as well. That also keeps the areas equal under that stretching. But I should do some stretching in the x direction and in the y direction um, to move the roots. To, uh, stretch the pit, if not rescale, to move roots. So you take this picture with the perfect value of b and stretch it sideways and stretch it up and down. The areas will stay equal to each other, um, but you can move the roots around to wherever you want them to be. And that's the end of question three. Question four asks us about a subset of the xy plane, and we're going to think about whether there is a nearest point of that subset to uh, another point, um, or not, whether there's no such point within S, or maybe more than one point in S. Okay, so to start off with, uh, we're going to think about the disk x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to one, so this is all the points inside here. Um, for a given point A, B, which might be in S or not, um, we're asked to find the unique point of S, which is closest to AB. Okay, so if AB is inside, then the closest point, sort of strangely, uh, is AB itself. Um, a distance of zero away, um, that point is in S, um, so the closest point in S is the point itself. Can't get closer than that. Um, if AB is outside, um, if a b outside, I suppose these are the two cases in this hint here, a squared plus b squared greater than 1 is outside, and this is inside. Okay, so if we're outside, then we want the point on uh, the outside of the circle, I suppose. The closest point will be on the outside of the circle um, in the right direction. I want to take the point on the outside of the circle in the direction of AB. Um, that's going to be a point, if I use vectors, um, that's going to be a point with um, the same direction as AB, um, but magnitude 1. So I should take my vector AB and divide it by the magnitude of AB. Okay, or, or said differently, I'd like a point with the sort of same... Uh, the same angle around the circle, so maybe I could think about tan theta being y over x being kind of b over a, um, and I'd like to find x and y such that x squared plus y squared equals 1 and y over x equals b over a. Um, go and solve those equations. Uh, being careful to make sure that you are actually in the right direction, thinking carefully about lots of square roots along the way, uh, and you'll get back to this point on the circumference of the circle. Okay, that's the closest point on the circle to a point that's outside the circle, um, and if the point is inside the circle, the closest point inside the circle to the, to the point is the point itself. Okay, um, part two asks us about an example of a subset uh, and a given point, AB, so we get to choose the subset and we get to choose the point such that there is no point of S which is nearest to AB. And that seems a bit strange, right, because um, if I make S some points, then I can find the distance to each of them, to from each of them to my point AB, and then maybe there'll be a, a closest one, right? Um, but actually, you could do something like having a circle with no outside. Um, so it, up here, it was really important that those points inside the uh, circumference of the circle were part of the set. Um, if I take s to be, if I take s to be the points x squared plus y squared less than one, just the points inside the circle, then has that has no point of s nearest to two zero or point outside the circle, because I can get really near to the edge of the circle. There's lots of examples of points that are pretty near to two zero, getting very close to the um, edge of the circle, but the point on the edge of the circle is not in S, um, so there's no 
there's no kind of limit of that process. Um, okay, so that's a little bit tricky. Um, another sort of more cheeky example might be to take um, uh, S, the empty set, uh, the set with no points in it at all, um, because then there is no point of S that's nearest to AB for any example AB, uh, because there are no points in S. Okay, um, so maybe a cheeky example. Um, okay, but in general, I think you want something with um, this kind of soft edges so that um, there's no kind of hard edge that's actually closest to your point AB. Okay, um, part three uh, wants us to come up with an example of a subset S and a point AB such that there's more than one point of S nearest to AB. I was still thinking about circles here, so I thought about uh, taking sort of, you know, the outside of the circle um, because that's full of points that are the same distance. Um, for me, this said more than one point said same distance. Uh, when I hear same distance, and I'm thinking about circles already, I'm thinking about the outside of a circle, all the points there are the same distance from the origin. So if I just take the outside of the circle, um, then every point on S actually is the, is the nearest to AB because they're all the same distance away from AB. So every point is the nearest. Okay, um, so many such points, a unique point or no such point. In this case, many, in this case, none, in this case, a unique uh, closest point. Um, okay. Part four changes tack a little bit and asks us about the distance from a point to a line. Uh, that's just Pythagoras. So you can write down Pythagoras to say what the distance is. X minus A, difference of X coordinates squared, plus that y over there is mx plus c minus b squared, and then take the square root. Uh, that's my distance, I'll call it d. Um, the question wants us to show that there's a unique point of s that's nearest to a, b. So that means minimize, or find a minimum distance. Um, minimum distance, you know, I, I don't really want to differentiate. This is some horrible function involving square roots and squares, and I don't really know how to differentiate it using math. Uh, mathematics um, but I suppose the minimum of D is also because D is positive is also the minimum of D squared um, because um, squares increasing for positive numbers um, if I want to find the minimum of this thing I could find the minimum of the square of this thing a bit like making the hypotenuse as long as possible with Pythagoras um, this thing here is a quadratic in x, the coefficient of x squared is m squared plus 1, which is positive, so it has a unique minimum. So there is a unique point. So unique point, I'll give us a unique value of x um, in s, which is nearest to a, b. A unique point minimizes that distance. Okay. Um, Part five uh, flips this around and says, we're given a subset S, we're not told what it is, we're gonna work out what it is. Um, and we're told that for any point AB, the nearest point of S to AB. So this is a point of S um, we're given here. We're asked to describe the subset S, which includes, I suppose, all of these points. As we, as we change A and B, as we move A and AB around, we're finding different points of S. Um, this rule is giving us some expression to say, well, as you move AB around, you find these other points um, to do with A and B. Um, all of these points lie in S. Um, they've got X coordinate A plus 2B minus 2 over 5, and they've got Y coordinate 2A plus 4B plus 1 over 5. After staring at these equations a little bit, I spotted that this one involves A plus 2B, and this one involves 2a plus 4b, and which is double. So I suppose if I want to exploit that, I could write something like 5x plus 2, that's a plus 2b. I could, if you double that, then you get 2, uh, you get 5y minus 1. Um, 5x plus 2 is a plus 2b, and 5y minus 1 is 2a plus 4b. That's double that. Um, this is the equation of a line. Um, so all these points, all these points lie on the line. Um, y is two x uh, plus. Hang on, uh, four and one plus one. 
4 and 1 divided by 5, 1. Um, all these points lie on the line y is 2x plus 1. Um, and in fact, that's all of the points in S. Um, we get all of this line because we can change A to go through all of the points in this line, um, exploring along. And if there were any other points in S, Uh, then we would find them when AB is that point. So there's not some other secret hidden points, because we could take AB and move it to there and say, well, what's the closest point of S now? Is it this, if it's this point? Uh, because if that point's in S, then the closest point to AB will now be zero distance, it will now be that point. Um, but we haven't found any other other points as we change AB. This is the whole set of things we found. We can find everything in S by moving AB there. Um, so this is everything. So this really is the line y equals 2x plus 1. Um, maybe we could have thought about our previous um, maths for the distance to a line and spotted that this was the expression um, for a particular line. Okay. Okay, last part of the question says, suppose S has got this property. For any two points P and Q in S, the line segment PQ is also in S. So whenever you've got two points inside S, you can join them up with a line and everything on the line segment between P and Q is also in the set S. So I suppose that was true for the disk at the start, um, but it was not true for my outside of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, because if you draw a diameter in, I wasn't including all those points in S. Okay, so some sets do this and some sets don't. Um, okay, show that for a given point AB, there cannot be two distinct points of S which are nearest to AB. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, suppose there were... This is going to be a proof by contradiction. Um, suppose there were two points in S nearest. That would be same distance. Well, let's call them P and Q. Why not? Um, we've got two points P and Q in S, um, so I suppose I want to use this fact. Um, the line segment P Q is in S right now. Um, it feels like to me, if you're if you're the same distance from here to here, then you should probably be closer somewhere in between. Um, but this is like an isosceles triangle, right? Um, and you've got the same distance to P and Q, well, just drop a perpendicular to the midpoint. Um, and depending on how much you like Euclidean geometry, you can maybe write that up. I'm going to write it slightly differently. I'm going to, th I think, use part four um, to say uh, the distance from AB. Let's do the distance squared from AB to the line through PQ. I'm trying to use this fact up here. I'm going to talk about the whole line to use part four. Um, the distance squared is a quadratic. How do you spell quadratic? There we go. Quadrac. Oh, no. How do you spell <laughs> quadratic? Um, and because it's a quadratic, uh, I suppose it's a quadratic with positive x squared coefficient. A happy quadratic. Um, if it's equal distance to P and Q, then it'll look like this. This is a graph of D squared um, with two different points where it's equal. So lower distance in between which I maybe talk about some derivatives here. Uh, it's a quadratic, so we know loads of facts about quadratics. I'm quite comfortable talking about quadratics. I mean, you know, it's got, um, uh, you find the second derivative, there's a unique single, unique point where the second derivative is zero in between uh, any two uh, roots. Um, so, or any two points at the same value, uh, halfway in between, I think. Um, so there's a point in between that's closer. Uh, that's a contradiction. Uh, so my proof by contradiction is complete. Um, there can't possibly be two different points um, the same distance um, in S because then the line segment, both of them closest, because then the line segment in between would also be 
closer to the point A, B, and in S. So that's a contradiction. And that's the end of this question. Okay, question five. This talks about the number of ways to split up a set of n things into subsets. Each subset's got to be at size at least two, and uh, and most n elements, I suppose, because that's how many there are. Um, we're going to write f of n k. That's a function with two inputs. The first input there is the number of elements, and the second input is the number of subsets we're looking for. So here are all of the subsets of five things the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, into exactly two subsets. Um, order within the subsets doesn't matter. So 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, um, that's, the same as, that's the same as this first one listed here. Um, so within a subset, order doesn't, order doesn't matter. And also the, the order that the subsets are listed in here doesn't matter either. Um, we're just looking at how they're paired together, how they're grouped up. Okay, part one of the question says, um, explain why there are no possible partitions, this thing is zero, um, if k is too big, if it's bigger than n over two. So I suppose that says if n is less than two k. Well, hang on, that's, that's because we haven't got enough elements, that's what this inequality says. Um, so I'm gonna write not enough elements and then work out what I mean. Well, 2k, hang on, if we've got k subsets of 2 each, if we've got k subsets of 2 or more each, then we need at least 2k elements. If n is less than 2k, we haven't got enough things to put in all of these subsets. Okay, so no possible partitions meeting this constraint. We have at least two things in each subset. Okay, part two says, what's the value of fn1? So this means uh, one subset. Um, one subset would be all of the things. Uh, all of the things together. There's only one way to do that, right? Um, so fn1 is equal to one, just one way. There's only one way to put everything together. And then... If I'm, if I'm concentrating, I think it back a little bit to, hang on, there's this other rule going on that we need at least two elements in there. So in fact, F11 is zero because not enough elements. If we've only got one thing, there are no ways to put all of the all of the elements together into a subset of size two or more. Um, so this is true if n is bigger than one. If n is equal to one, there's no allowed uh, ways to partition the elements. Okay, going well so far. We found out that this function is sometimes zero, sometimes one, maybe some other numbers. Let's find out. Um, part three gets us to think about a recursion relation um, to relate values of this function to uh, previous values. Um, we're asked to find an equation to relate f of n plus 1k, so that's splitting n plus 1 items into k, plus k subsets, in k subsets, um, in terms of f of n minus 1, that would be n minus 1 things, uh, in k minus 1 subsets, or f, and also in terms of f of n k, so that's n things in k subsets. We're told that this is going to hold when two is uh, two is less than or equal to k is less than n, um, and we're supposed to think of it like this. Um, we're supposed to think about forming an allowable partition of this set into subsets of at least two elements. That's the number of ways to do this. As a reminder here, is well, I suppose with with k k subsets is f n plus one k. That's this first item that we're told to find an equation for. Okay, so we're supposed to think about the number of ways to do this. And in each case, we can either pair item n plus one with exactly one other element. Okay, so that'll be in its own little bubble over here. Uh, n plus one paired with something. 
and then n minus 1 other things that we've got to pair up. And there might be lots of ways to pair those up. Um, in particular, I suppose, so after pairing, after pairing n plus 1, we've got loads of possibilities about what we do with the other n minus 1 things. Um, I need to split them into k minus 1 partitions because I've already used one of my partitions um, on this n plus 1 partnering up with one other thing. Um, okay, so I need to think a little bit about how many possibilities there are over here, but then whatever I pair n plus 1 with, I've got lots of possibilities for the rest. I've got f of n minus 1, k minus 1, ways I can partition up the rest of the items. Um, each of those is going to be a different case, isn't it? Because I've done something different in here um, for each choice I make here. Um, and then whatever I want to do. If I want n plus 1 to be paired with one thing, then I'll consider each thing. Okay, so I need to think about each possibility of what I pair n plus 1 with. Okay, I'll come back to that in a moment. Other possibility is that instead of pairing n plus 1 with just one thing, um, we pair it with lots of things. Um, and in that case we're thinking, I suppose, about having k subsets um, and having n plus 1 in with more than, uh, more than one other element. I suppose if that's the case, then we could remove n plus 1 and it would be an allowable partition because there would still be two other things left in there. This little subset over here is not okay if we remove n plus 1 because everything needs to have two elements in it. Um, this would just be on its own. Um, so this alternative is what if n plus 1 is not vital for its subset? What if the subset would survive without n plus 1? Well, in that case, um, that partition, we could think of it as one of the ones, uh, one of the partitions of n objects into k partitions with n plus 1 added in to one of the partitions. Doesn't matter which one, it's going to be sort of unnecessary in any of them. Um, we're going to add n plus 1. Uh, the element n plus 1 into one of those partitions. Okay, let's try and count the number of ways altogether then. So I'm going to write f of n plus 1k, that's the thing we're counting, and my choices are to either do the thing in the first bullet point, or totally separately, I could do one of the things in the second bullet point. So I've got kind of two cases, um, first bullet point, or some extra options from thinking about the second bullet point. So I'm going to have two things added together. First bullet point, I'm thinking about pairing n plus 1 with something. Well, there are n choices of what I pair it with. Um, and then for each choice I make, I can independently choose um, some partition of the remaining elements into k plus k minus 1 um, subsets. Um, okay, alternatively, that's the first bullet point. So I've got all the, all the choices of what I pair n plus 1 with, and then all these choices separately of what I do with the other elements. Um, second bullet point says I should think about fnk, the ways of splitting up um, n objects, the first n objects, into k subsets, and then add n plus 1 into one of those subsets. There are some choices about which one I add it to. There are k choices of which thing I add, uh, which subset I add n plus 1 into. Um, so take all of those possibilities, f, n, k, of all the pos all possible ways to partition those elements, chuck n plus 1 into one of them. And that will be um, unique because um, if I take n plus 1 out, then I'll get uh, a partition. So this is counting very carefully all the partitions that I could be adding n plus 1 into. Okay, um, that's my equation. It relates f, n plus 1, k, to f, n minus 1, k minus 1, uh, and also f, n, k. Okay, part four asks us to use this expression that we just found to work out f of 7, 3. Seven things split into three partitions. Um, I don't want to go and count them, I want to use the equation that we just had. Um, so here I'm going to use this expression with a carefully chosen n and a carefully chosen k. Um, and I'm going to replace all the n's and k's with the right numbers to make this work. Um, I think I want n to be 6 and k to be 3. So I'm going to very carefully write out this right-hand side. n is 6, k is 3, um, plus n is 6, k is 3, n is 6, k is 3. Okay, um, so I've got this expression. Uh, and now I'm going to need to go and work out f of 5, 2 
and I suppose also f of 6, 3, so I've kind of got twice as many calculations to do, but they involve smaller numbers, right? Um, the numbers are getting smaller each time, um, so I'm not too worried. Um, the numbers are going to get smaller, and I'm going to do more of these calculations. Goodness, right, off we go then. f52, so now I'm going to set n to 4, k to 2. Um, n is 4, k is 2. Um, so that's 3, 1, plus uh, n is 4, k is 2. Uh, so now I need to work out f31. Oh, hang on, that's just 1, isn't it? f31 is 1 by part 2, we said. If you're going to put them all into one subset, as long as you've got enough of them, uh, then that's, there's only one way to do that. Uh, but I do need to work out f42. Um, that's going to be n is 3 k is 2. So that's going to be 3 f of uh, 2, 1. Um, looks like that's 1 again. Um, because there's only one way to put two things into a subset of size 2. Um, plus k here is 2. f of n k is 3, 2. f of 3, 2 is 0 because there are no ways to put three things into subsets of size 2. That was part 1 of the question. And there's not enough things over here. Okay, so working backwards, what have I got? Um, this, this bit is 0. I haven't worked out f6, 3 yet. Um, this thing's 3, so then this bit is 6, this is 1, so this is 10. Okay, going quite well. I found out this first bit here is 10. I still need to work out f of 6, 3. Okay, f of 6, 3 is, I'll set n to be 5 and k to be 3. Um, so that'll give me 5 f of 4, 2, plus uh, k is 3, f of n, k. Uh, 4, what is that, 4, 6, n minus 1, I've written the same thing for n and n minus 1, n is 5 here isn't it, uh, yeah because I've got n is 5 and k is 3, okay, this last term here is 0 because there's not enough elements, it's part 1 again, um, if you want to split things into 3 subsets of size 2 or more then you're going to need more than 5 of them, um, so this is 0, f42 I already worked out was 10, um, was it 10? Oh no, this whole sum was 10. F42 was 3. So this is 15. Uh, my total sum at the end there, F73 is finally 6 times 10 plus 3 times 15 is 60 plus 45 is 105. That's quite a lot of partitions. I'm quite glad that I didn't try and work them all out and write them all down and count them. 105 is too big. Okay, one part of the question left. Part 5 would like a formula for f of 2nn in terms of n, and it's possible to go back to basics and work out an expression for this by thinking about partitions of 2n things into uh, uh, subsets of size 2. All of the subsets have to be size 2 here because there's n of them, and we've only just got enough things to make n subsets of size 2 or more. Um, instead, I want to go back to the equation that we had, which was f n plus 1k is equal to n f n minus 1 k minus 1 plus k f n k and I want, to, I want to think about what goes on there uh, if we plug in 2 n and n um, because we just saw f 6 3 looked really horrible but it turned out to not be that much work because almost straight away I ran into a thing that was zero. Um, let's try and piece this together so for f 2 n n this is a little bit mind mind bending but I need to Think about this expression, take all of the n's and replace them with 2n minus 1. Um, if that makes you unhappy, then maybe think about this using different letters, like a and b over here. And then I'm happily setting a to be 2n minus 1. Okay, and k to be n, but not the same n as up here. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to be careful to do this substitution exactly once. Uh, fn 2 minus 2, k minus 1 plus k is this number, f of this n here means one less than the number I started with on the left, uh, one less, uh, and k here means the same thing over here. Now here's the point, um, when we were looking at f63 we found out this last bit was zero, and actually in general this is zero isn't it, because we've got slightly too few elements, we need 2n elements, to split them into n subsets of size 2 or more, and we've got 2n minus 1. 
So this is zero. Um, this is fantastic news because now this relationship just says this is 2m minus 1 times, I'm going to factorise that a little bit, um, f of 2 times m minus 1, m minus 1. That's the previous term in the kind of series of thinking about f 2n n. Um, so once again we've got here, this, no this number I'm calculating over here is a bit like the number I started with. One of the inputs is twice as big as the other. So I can repeat this process. Um, this says that I get 2n minus 1, 1 minus the first number out. So then I'll get 2 minus 3 out. And these will go down by 1 again, repeating that process. And I can keep repeating the process until I get all the way down. So multiplying together 2n minus 5, 2n minus 7, and so on, down through, um, I suppose those are odd numbers, times 5, times 3, times, and then right near the end, I'll have, let's be very careful, um, this will be f of, and then this will be f of 2, 1. And there is exactly one way to split two things into a subset of size 2 or more, which is just, just write them together. Okay, so I've got the product of all of the odd numbers from 1 up to 2n minus 1. That's my formula for 2n n, and it's correct because it's used the formula that we worked out in part 3. And that's the end of question 5. Question 6 defines a new way of writing numbers called flexadecimal. Um, which has these cool angle brackets around the numbers. The rule for flexidecimal numbers is sort of that in each place there's some acceptable digits um, and they're not allowed to be too large. Um, so here this number is not a flexidecimal number. Uh, this one's okay, the two's okay, but this three is too big for its position. The rule is that counting from the right the maximum you can have there is, um, in the digit di, is the maximum you can have is i. Um, so this number is allowed to be up to 1, this number is only allowed to go up to 2. So this is a flexidecimal number over here. Um, this, this is allowed to be as much as 1, 2, 3, 4, so pushing it just there, and then 5. So this is, this is acceptable. Okay, um, here's how you add 1 in flexidecimal, and this is going to set out what order the flexidecimal numbers go in. Um, to add 1 to a flexidecimal number, well, if there's a 0 on the end, you just increase that to 1. Um, those are both the allowed digits in that place. Um, but if it's already a 1, which it might be, then replace it by 0. This is like, this is like carrying over. Replace it by 0 and add, um, move to the left and add, add 1. Um, so, and again, over there, if that makes the digit too big, then replace it with zero and move move to the one. So sort of move one, increase by one to the left. Um, so this is this is the process for adding up. Okay, um, have I got that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If it gets too big, replace it by zero and again move to the left. Okay. Um, yes, right, we're asked to write the numbers 5 to 13 in flexidecimal. So we've got the first ones here, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0. Um, so the next numbers are going to be, uh, let's do a little table, um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Those are in decimal. Um, and to add 1 to this number, I can just increase the last digit by 1. Um, this number's a bit different because I want to add 1 here. Um, so I'll write 0, carry the 1. Um, I'm not allowed to write 3 here, so I'll write 0, and I'll carry 1 over. Okay, but then 7 is 101. 8, I'm not allowed to write 2 in this place, so I'll carry 1 over. 9, I'm going to just write 1, 1, 1. 10, um, I'm not allowed to write 2 here, so I'll carry the 1 over. I am allowed to write 2 here, um, so this doesn't carry all the way across. Um, it stops there. Uh, 11 looks like this. 12 is interesting because um, I'm not allowed to write 2 here, so I carry the 1 over. Um, I'm not allowed to write 3 here, so I carry, I go around to 0 and I carry the 1 over. Right, 2 there. Uh, and then 13 is going to be 2, oh, 1, just adding 1 like that. Okay, um, so there's some interesting patterns going on in here already. The next part of the question uh, wants us to explore what those patterns are. 
Okay, so it asks us for a workable procedure to convert flexible de flexidecimal numbers to decimal. So if you see a flexidecimal number like this, can you work out what's happened? Um, and I suppose the thing we really want to do is work out the kind of place value of these numbers. I want to do something involving this 1, 2, 2, 1 in here. Um, and that's going to involve, I think, working out what each of the digits means. And there's this kind of pattern in the last digits so that uh, once you've carried over in, once you've carried over out of the last two digits, you get this kind of repeating pattern: zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, two, zero, two, one, zero, zero again. So there's this kind of um, repeating pattern, which means that um, that repeats every so often. If we can work out how often, then we know what the digit to the left is worth in terms of its place value. Every time we know when that's going to carry over. Um, okay, it looks like six, doesn't it? Um, so. Um, it looks to me like one carries over from this last place um, every two numbers. One carries over from the second digit from the right every six numbers. So we actually get up to, uh, uh, we have something like this, where one's carried over to the third digit. Uh, and then we have something like this over here. That's taken three times as long. Uh, six is three times two. Um, it's taking three times as long. And I think that makes sense because there's three possibilities for what uh, the digit to the right there could be. It could be zero, one, or two. Um, so it's taking three times as long to, to uh, tick up. Okay, let's try and predict how long it would take the next digit to come into play. Um, we've seen that this thing out the front increases by one every, every six numbers we uh, go through in flexidecimal and it needs to get all the way to four before we have a problem because this digit is allowed to go uh, for between one two it's allowed to be three so we'll get the we'll get to fourth the fourth place uh, is going to be 24 four times six uh, because this digit here will need to get carried over into four times um, until it gets outside its allowed range um, Similarly, we can keep going. Um, this number so it takes more increments to uh, uh, eventually get around, but once you've carried over five times, this will be one happily, then it'll carry over to two, it'll carry over to three and four happily, but then five is too much. Um, so it'll finally carry over and give us zeros everywhere else, um, five times as much. These numbers are the factorial numbers. Um, so they are four factorial, four times three times two times one, three factorial, um, I suppose this was two, um, like this. Uh, that is one, which is one factorial. Um, okay, um, and I hope you can see um, why that's happened from the way that the numbers carry over. Um, putting that into words um, is what the question actually wants us to do. I don't really have space to uh, write that out in words, but I suppose I'd write something like, um, uh, consider place value. Uh, think about when one gets carried over. Uh, it's um, for dk. This is k times dk minus one, sort of in some sense. Um, so, k factorial. Okay, um, I'm going to demonstrate this by converting 1, 2, 2, 1 to a decimal. Um, so, this 1 at the front, this has come from uh, things being carried over 24 times. Um, this 2 here, this has come from some more carrying over. Not as much as 24, um, just as much as 6 to get to increase. It takes 6 to increase this by 1. Um, and then this thing here has come from... Uh, uh, two increments twice, uh, and this last one is worth one. Uh, adding that up, we get 24 and 12 and 4 and 1 is 36, 41. So this is the number 41. Okay, part three wants us to do the opposite, uh, find a method for converting decimal numbers to flexidecimal. Um, so this means thinking about, um, so this means thinking about uh, writing 
in terms of factorials. A little bit like how you would write something in binary by thinking about powers of 2 that were smaller than it. Um, here we can think about factorials that are smaller. So just subtract biggest factorial possible repeatedly, I think, works. OK, so 255 is 120 plus um, 135. Uh, 135 is 120 plus 15. Um, 15 is, well, what's a smaller factorial? Uh, something like 6 uh, plus, well, it's 6 plus 6, isn't it? 6 plus 6 plus, and then 3 is 2 plus 1. Um, so I think I've got two 120s. I've got no 24s. Uh, and then I've got two sixes, two and a one to give me the flexidecimal number 20211. Um, okay, so I've thought about writing this in terms of factorials, um, which I found by just subtracting the biggest factorial I can think of at each time. I suppose this works because I can't possibly have too many 120s in here. Too many 120s for this place would be precisely 720, which is the next factorial up. So then I, I wouldn't have been subtracting the biggest factorial possible if I could have been subtracting 720. OK, part four wants us to add together flexidecimal numbers. Um, and we're not supposed to convert them to decimal. We're supposed to think about what happens if we add them in flexidecimal by thinking about, the, the I suppose, the place values of those numbers in flexidecimal. So here I'd like to think about adding them together, I suppose, Sometimes we're going to have to carry over if things get too big for the place. Um, let's try and think generally. If we've got some addition going on and we've got a number like a 2 and a 1 here, um, but this place was, let's say, only allows to be, to be 2, um, then when I try and add them together, I'm supposed to carry over, right? So instead of writing 3 here, I would write 0 and I would sort of add 1 to the left. Okay, so my sum would be 0 here and add, add 1 over to the left. Um, that's the rule of how flexidecimal works, I suppose, that um, when you get too big, you loop around to 0 again, but you add 1 to the digit on the left. Okay, what does that actually mean? If it's allowed to be 2, then 2 is fine, but more than 2, you have to subtract um, subtract one more than two, right? You subtract the three. Three was the problem. Three was enough to tick you over to the next one. Okay, I need to be careful here. Um, so, I want to work right from left, because that's what I do with decimal numbers, uh, and because carrying over to the left means that I want to think about the right before I get <laughs> to the things on the left. Um, adding in place. If in digit... Uh, if in digit, oh, I need a number or something, uh, dk or something, um, sum is k plus 1 or more, then I guess subtract, so k plus 1 would be, k plus 1 would be enough to get us around to 0, and then k plus 2, I suppose, we'd want to get 1 instead and carry 1. So I need to subtract k plus 1 from sum and carry the 1. <laughs> um, so that's add an extra 1 to the digit to the left, which might cause us to do more carries. So maybe we should include that somewhere in here. Uh, the sum of inputs plus any carry that's going on. OK. So if there was a carry already, that might cause you to do another carry. Um, and it's, it happens if the sum is more is more than it's allowed to be, so more than more than uh, k in general, um, then subtract k plus 1, because it's k plus 1 that actually ticks you over around to 0 again. OK, then carry the 1. Right, OK, let's try and add 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 0, 1 together. OK, so... 1 plus 1 is 2, welcome to the mat live stream, but 2 is too big for this column, so I'm going to subtract 1 plus 1 is 2, subtract 2, and write 0, carry the 1. Okay. 
Um, now I've got 2 plus 0 plus 1, that's 3, which is too big for this column. This column's only allowed to be 2. Um, subtract the uh, subtract 3 from this, because this is exactly this case. Look, 2 plus 1, where it's only allowed to be 2. Subtract 3 and carry the 1. Now I've got 5, which is way too big for the, the, th the column that's only allowed to be 3. Um, I'm going to subtract 4 from that number. K plus 1 is 4. Um, and carry the 1 again and get around to this. Uh, 2100. Um, quick sanity check. They told me not to convert them to decimal and add them, but I'm going to do that anyway um, just to see what happens. So this was 24 plus 12 plus. Uh, if I can get this right, then it will be a good comparison. 624 plus 1, 36. This was 41. We did that in the last part, didn't we? 201 is uh, 12 plus 1 is 13. So this should be the sum of 41 and 13 is 54. Whereas over here, I've got 2 times 24 is 48 plus another 6 is 54. Okay, great. Um, don't tell anyone, but I've converted to decimal and checked my answer. Okay. Part 5 wants us to check whether a flexidecimal number is a multiple of 3. Um, I suppose after one of the columns is worth 6, right? And one of the next column is worth 24, which is also a multiple of 3. And in fact, all of the factorials are multiples of 3 after 3 factorial. So it's just the first couple of digits that I need to worry about. Um, because after that... So that's multiple of three, and then that's that's, that's not, that's not, uh, that's the number two, uh, and then three is okay. Um, what happens next? So three is three is is good, um, and then four is uh, two o. That's not a multiple of four. Two one is the number five. That's not okay, and then six is the number one o o. Okay, so what do these have in common? Um, it looks a bit like if the last digits, I mean, if it's not, if it's zero or it's one one, fine. Um, it looks a bit like if the last two digits are naught naught or one one, then I think you're a multiple of three. In the first case, because you're actually a multiple of six, um, all of the place values to the left of that are multiples of six. Um, and in this case, because you're exactly three more, you've been incremented three more times after a multiple of six, um, so you're a multiple of three. Um, all of the other cases, I think you're a multiple of three plus one, two, four, or five. So I think you're not a multiple of three. So I think this is all of the cases. Um, I'm not sure if I believe that zero ends in OO, so I'll be really careful and I'll say or zero is also a multiple of 3. So without converting it to decimal, I could just look at the last couple of digits, if it's 0, or if it's 0 in 1 at the end, that's a multiple of 3. Part 6 wants us to think about arranging all the letters, all of the arrangements of the letters A, B, C, D, E, F in alphabetical order and numbered in flexidecimal, um, which is such a strange idea. Um, I really like it though. Um, so I think the thing that's going on when we increment here is um, it's swapping. Well, no, so it looks like, to start off with, it looks like it's swapping the last two letters, but then this E moves over here, and then it's it's not immediately clear to me what's going to happen next. I suppose the next one would be A, B, C, E, F, D. So it would swap the last two, two letters again, and we get up to the, uh, what is that, third thing? We're counting from zero, so third thing. Um, a, B, C, E, F, D. Um, okay, so we're asked what happens when we get all the way down to position 34101 in flexidecimal. Um, we could convert that to decimal. I'm not sure that would be very helpful. Um, it's some huge number of moves later. Um, maybe we should be thinking about what's going on every so often. I've noticed there are there's there's a nice number of arrangements. Look, there are six factorial arrangements, which is this number, isn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six factorial. Okay, so we've got six factorial arrangements. Um, I suppose there's six factorial because there's six choices for what the first letter is, and then after that, five choices for the second letter, then four, then three, then two, then one choice for what you write down next. Those 
in alphabetical order, if I think about the whole, kind of whole picture, there's sort of a bunch of things starting with A at the front, and then some things starting with B. You know, I've seen a dictionary. I know what dictionaries look like. Um, words that start with C, and then D, and then E, and then F. So if I want to get a rough idea of where we are in this list of words, um, I need to think a little bit about how big this number is. Um, so I suppose three here gives me a rough sense of how big this number is. Um, what is that? One, two, three, four, five. So that's three times 120 in, in terms of what that place value means. Um, this number is bigger than that. So this means that this is um, more than three times 120 um, words in. Um, I suppose this was the word number zero, and there's 120 of them here. So then this is 120, this is 240, there's one sixth of them there. Um, and going up in 120s, this is 360, this is 480. In flexidecimal, I suppose that's zero, one o o o o, four zeros, two o o o o is the first word starting with C. And um, three o o o o is the first word starting with D. And then over here, four o o o o is the first word starting with E. And five o o o o is the first word starting with F. Um, we're somewhere in the Ds, aren't we? Uh, words starting with D, because we've gone through three lots of one twenty and then some more, but not as many as another lot of one twenty. Okay. Um, Seems okay, we're going to start with D. Let's think about what's going on inside that bit of the dictionary. Um, so inside there, we've got all these words that start with D. Uh, inside, there'll be some words that start with uh, the next letter A. Uh, it can't be D again, can it? Uh, but it could be A, B, C, E, F next. Um, and we've got four lots of, I've spotted a pattern, you see, four lots of 24 uh, down and then some. Um, so we want to skip past um, one, two, three, four lots of 24, and we're somewhere in these words that start D, F. Um, we're somewhere in there. Um, inside there, we could look at the words that start A, B, C, we've used D, um, so D, F, A, B, C, E. There are think four factorial is 24 words, almost few enough that I could write them on the screen, but there are 24 of these, and we want to find the, what is this, one and six, we want to find the seventh word in this list, if I convert this last bit to the last bit to decimal, um, or I suppose uh, slightly better, if I think about that as six plus one, then I want to go down, skip the first six words in the list, the first six words have A as the third letter, and go down to this B. So uh, inside the B words, I think I want the first thing in here, but let's think carefully. So A, C, E, um, those are words that have the fourth letter A, C, or E. There's now only six possibilities going on. Um, zero, so I don't, want, I don't want to skip past the first two words. I'm somewhere in the first two words. Um, so I want an A next. Um, and then after my A, I can either have a C or E. Um, and I'm at 1, which means that I'm not at C, I'm at E. So I've got D, F, B, A, E, C. It's my final answer for what word I've got to. By thinking really carefully um, about how many words I've skipped out in this list. And that's question 6. Question seven. Um, this question is about two black boxes. Um, each has got a display on it and two buttons uh, marked A and B. Okay, so we've got our two maths machines uh, and they've each got a display on um, that has some digits, I think N digits. Um, yeah, it's N digit display. Um, button A resets the box to zero. Uh, and button B updates the display using some weird function f. 
uh, and we're not told any facts about F. Um, so pressing button A to reset the machine, and then pressing button B displays this fixed sequence. Okay, so it's deterministic, um, but we're not told what F is. Um, in general, XI here is what happens when you apply F um, I times. Okay, um, bad news. Um, we don't have pen and paper. Uh, and the display has too many digits for us to remember more than a few displayed values. Um, we can compare the two boxes to see if they're equal, and we can count the number of times we've pressed the button. So our strategy to try and work out what this function is doing, I suppose, could be something like um, press the button on one box, uh, and then reset it, or, or no, wait, press the button once, uh, press the button here twice, and see if those are the same or not, or we could press this one three times, press this one four times, remembering to reset in between experiments, and see if those things match up. So we can compare the numbers on the boxes. That's why we've got two of them, I suppose. Okay, are they identical boxes? Yeah. So we don't know what the function is, but we know that these box boxes are doing the same thing as each other. Okay. First part of the actual question says, explain why there must be integers with i less than j such that xi is equal to xj. Well, we, <laughs> but this just means in uh, words that there are two numbers i and j so that after you press the button i times you get the same thing as after you've pressed the button j times um, that this sequence eventually repeats um, so not all sequences eventually repeat in general there are sequences like one two three four five six seven which uh, doesn't have any repeats in quite famously i suppose um, but here because the display only has n digits. So there's only, I'm saying only, 10 to the n different possibilities. So consider what would happen if you press the button 10 to the n plus 1 times. Must get a repeat somewhere. Maybe not the last time we press the button, but somewhere in there we must have a repeat. There's just not enough different numbers for all of these outputs to be different along the way. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. Um, at some point we're going to see the same display twice, just because uh, there's only so many unique displays that these boxes can show us. Okay, part two, show that if xi is equal to xj, so if the displays agree after i presses or after j presses, then xi plus s is equal to xj plus s for any s bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so I suppose this means um, xi plus s is what you would get if you press the button s more times. Um, so first press it i times to get to xi and then press the button s more times. That's what xi plus s means. And xj plus s is what happens if you press the button j times, and then press the button s more times. Okay, um, but these things are equal because xi is equal to xj. Um, so I can replace this xj with xi because xj is equal to xi, and now these things are exactly the same. Um, okay, because I suppose this function is uniquely defined, given an input. Uh, so given this input, and then do the function s times, that's deterministic, you're going to get the same thing over here as you get over here. Okay, part three asks us to think about what happens if m is the smallest number such that xm appears more than once in the sequence. Does that make sense? So some numbers appear more than once. We know that um, at some point there's going to be a repeat. xm is the smallest number, so the first thing in this sequence that is going to be repeated. Okay. And p bigger than 0 is the smallest number such that xm is equal to xm plus p. Okay, so that's the, the smallest number, so the next time that particular number comes up again. We know it comes up again because xm appears more than once in the sequence, so there is going to be some p such that xm is equal to xm plus p. Okay, um, show, that if x, it show that if i is bigger than or equal to m and k is bigger than or equal to 0, oh, goodness me, okay, then x of i plus kp is equal to xi. Okay, um, what do I think? So x of i plus kp, I want to use, a think, I think, a similar argument as, as I used over here to say, um, okay, um, this is something like 
um, after KP more presses um, on the button, uh, what's what's the what's the outputs? P is the smallest number. So all we know is that x m is equal to x m plus p. Um, show that if x i, should if we're told that we're told that i is bigger than or equal to m. So this is after we've reached the point x m, where eventually that's going to repeat. But we're not just being asked to show that that number comes up again and again and again, which I think it does, by the way, because I think x m plus two p would be equal to f to the p of x m plus p because it's p presses after x m plus p, but x m plus p is exactly equal to uh, x m, so this is x m plus p. So I think this sequence sort of continues that every p presses, we're gonna to get to x m again. Okay, let's think a little bit more about this. So we've got x i plus k p, we want to show that's equal to x i. Well, what is it equal to? It's equal to f to the k p of x i, and I suppose i is bigger than m. I'm trying to relate this back to m. So I'm going to write i is equal to um, m plus, I want some sort of offset like c or something. Um, so where c is something bigger than, or I suppose bigger than or, e or equal to zero because i could be equal to m. Okay, so we're gonna write i is m plus c. c is some positive number. Okay, so then we've got f to the kp of x m plus c. Same idea again, I think. I want to write that as f to the kp plus c of x m because I want to relate everything back to x m. Okay, um, this says start at x m and then press the button kp plus c times. I'm going to think about that as doing it, pressing the button kp times and then c times because addition is commutative. Uh, so we can think about pressing the button, grouping them in kps plus c, and then grouping them as c, or grouping them as c plus kp. Um, and that's exactly what I want, isn't it? Because every p presses, starting at xm, this is the thing that we had here, every p presses, uh, starting at xm, we know gets us back to xm. So here I think I want to extend this slightly to say from here, x m plus k p is equal to x m uh, to extend it from m plus m plus p m plus 2 p all the way I keep going and x m plus k p is equal to x m okay brilliant so this this is f to the c of x m almost done that's x m plus c which is exactly x i that is what i wrote down for x i okay so this says that x i plus k p is equal to x i in words that means that after m, each number that you see in the sequence is repeated um, uh, a distance p later in the sequence, and then it, it keeps repeating every p. So you, you, you'll see some numbers, and then it'll start repeating every p afterwards. Um, okay, great. Part four, um, here it's going to ask us to show that if two numbers repeat, um, then we must be after m. I suppose that's true because um, this is true because m is defined. M is defined to be the first first number that repeats. So m is less than or equal to i. Here's another example of a number number that repeats. Um, m is also less than or equal to j, but that's not so interesting because we're told that i is less than j. Okay, uh, hard part of the question though is to show that j minus i is a multiple of p. Um, the difference between um, where we are in the sequence is a multiple of p, the number we had before. Um, and the hint is to let r be the remainder when we divide j minus i by p. Okay, right, uh, do I want to write, so I suppose I want to write j minus i if I'm following the hint, uh, something like kp plus r. Um, okay, so... What have we got? Um, well, we know that, so here R is less than P, it's the remainder. Um, okay, so I think I can see that J minus I is the, the kind of distance between these in terms of button presses. So I could say something like uh, X I, if you press the button J minus I times, that's going to be X J. Okay, 
Um, but also, I'm going to write that with the hint as kp plus r of xi. And I know that i is bigger than or equal to m, so I can use part 3 to say, well, if you're up here, then things tend to uh, repeat if you do kp presses. So this is f to the r of xi. So this step, this step using part 3. After m, if you add on kp presses, you get back to the same value. Um, so those kp presses get us around. And then we're at fr of xi. OK. Um, so xj is equal to fr of xi. Oh, but xi is also supposed to be equal to xj. So now I've got an example with xi is equal to xi plus r and r is less than p. Um, that feels like a problem because I know that p was supposed to be the smallest number such that things come back. Um, let's try and make that a little bit more concrete. Um, I'm worried to see about what happens when we get rounds to x m plus p or x m plus um, the next the next time we see x m in the sequence. Um, we're supposed to only see only see x m in the sequence every p terms because p is the smallest number um, such that uh, p here is the smallest number such that x m is equal to x m plus p. So I'm going to think about what happens the next time we see x m. Well, the next time we see xm, we'll press the, keep pressing the button until we get around to xm. And so later, well, I don't quite want to put this into uh, algebra, but later we'll see xm twice separated by r less than p. But that's a contradiction. Or well, that's nonsense. Because p is supposed to be... p is supposed to be... The smallest such number. Um, there's only one get out of jail card, and our get out of jail card is to say, well, if r is zero, then actually this, this these weren't two different numbers. Um, this was just saying that xi was equal to xi, which is true and allowed. Um, so not a problem if r is a multiple of p. It's less than p, uh, i.e. 0. OK, um, brilliant. So r must be 0. The remainder is 0. So j minus i is a multiple of p. Great stuff. Right. OK. Um, part 5 gets us to do an experiment. Um, we take our two boxes. We press button b once on one box. b is the one that applies to function f. And we press the button b twice on the other box each time. Uh, compare the displays and see if we can find the smallest number u such that x u is equal to x 2 u. So we'll, we'll press the left box once, press the button on the right box twice, and repeat that until we see the same number on both boxes. So I suppose this can only happen if by part 4 u is a multiple of no, what do I mean? U here, U has got to be bigger than or equal to M. Uh, that's what's going on. That was what was going on before. And if um, we also need um, the difference here in presses, which is also U, we need two U minus U to be a multiple, a multiple of P. Okay, so U multiple of P, multiple of P, and bigger than M. We're looking for the first time this happens, so u must be the smallest multiple of p uh, bigger than m. Uh, once we hit that smallest multiple of p bigger than m, then whatever x u is, x two u will be the same because it's gone round multiple of p times ahead and hit the same number and that's the first time that can happen because we need to be bigger than m and we need u to be a multiple of p. Okay, so u must be the smallest multiple of p that's bigger than m. Okay, I've realised back in part 4 this said if and only if, so really I should have gone back and checked that actually if j minus i was a, j minus I was a multiple of p then everything worked out. Um, and in fact that's fine, if i is bigger than m 
and J minus I was multiple of P, then that's exactly part three. Um, I just didn't say that out loud. Um, that the the oh the if part is um, part three. Okay. Part six gets us to design a new experiment to work out the value of m. So now, now at this stage we know u, um, which is the smallest multiple of p that's bigger than m. So we know that u is some sort of multiple of um, p, and I suppose we've got a bound on what m is. Um, I suppose what we want is we want to find the first number, xm is the first number that repeats. It's the first point at which we're in this repeating loop. It's a bit tricky because we can't write down the numbers on the way to finding x u. We can't write all of them down because we don't have pen and paper. Um, so we can't just write down all of the numbers and then look out for them later on. We're going to have to use the two boxes. Um, so I suppose we want one of them. So I'm going to use use one of the boxes. Uh, to count to M. I suppose I can't start running that box yet. I can't start pressing the button yet because I I don't know what I'm looking for. Um, I don't know um, whether it started repeating or not. Um, what I need is some way to know is this one of the repeating numbers or not. Um, so I need to get the other box. So first get the other box into the repeating loop. Okay, so that just means more than M <laughs> presses, which I can do because I know that if I do, I know that U was um, bigger than M. So EG do U presses. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure if I want to do exactly U or more than U presses on that box. I just want to get one ready to be in the repeating loop. I've got a bit of a problem, though, that um, uh, if, uh, as I'm as I'm looking looking through numbers, I've got to check them against anything possible in the loop. Um, so here's my strategy, um, and I'm not sure this is the quickest strategy, but increase. Let's let's iterate one of the boxes very carefully. So I'll press it once. I first, first of all, I suppose I've got the second box. I've got the second box ready. I've got it into the loop. I've done U presses on that one. Um, then I'm going to press button B on the first box, I suppose, and I want to check whether that's in the loop. So now press button B on second box. Um, I want to do it a multiple of p times. Um, I want to do a multiple of p times so that I've gone, I know that I've gone all the way around. Ideally I'd just do it p times, but I don't know p yet. So I'll do it a multiple of p times. I know that u was a, a multiple of p from the previous part. So I could press the button on the second box, u times, watching it go round and round the numbers. I'm um, thinking maybe I recognise some of the numbers as it goes round and round and round the loop, um, but counting carefully to get to U and comparing the numbers to see if they match up. Um, if they match at any point, then great, we can we can relax now. Um, if not, then, um, if not, after pressing U times, then I'm ready to try X2. Um, so press, press the button on this box once um, and then compare it against all the values over here. Um, this method is a little bit mad. Um, you can, in fact, do better um, by choosing to do exactly U presses over here. Um, here's how the method um, works with some refinement. Um, so first, set, set the box, set, reset the boxes, and press press the button B on the second box U times, so that it's got up to X U. Um, once it's at X U. Okay, now we're ready to start looking for the loop. Um, when it's, we've got one box at x u and one box that we haven't started yet. Um, I suppose we could check is x not equal to x u. Um, if so, then m is equal to zero or something, right? Because that number's repeated. Um, okay, um, press both buttons next. 
uh, press button okay press button B on both boxes and compare X1 versus X U plus one um, this is sufficient so we can keep going like this to compare X2 versus X U plus two and so on um, because U is a multiple of P so if one of these numbers is XM if it's the first one that's going to repeat then it's going to match this the number over here um, so this is a little bit easier to do um, rather than comparing each value x1 x2 x3 x4 on one of the boxes rather than comparing that with everything in the repeating loop you can be slightly cleverer and just compare it with x i plus u i suppose um, because u is a multiple of p excuse me um, so that's cleverly using the fact that this that u is a multiple of p like that um, that's the solution on the web model solution on the MATWEB page. Okay, one more experiment to go. Part seven asks us to design one more experiment. Uh, at this stage, we know U and M. Um, so we know, I'm not sure if this is helpful any more, anymore, but we know XU, um, the number of presses we'd need to see this happen. We also know XM. So we know how many presses to do, um, how many presses, before it starts repeating. So now I think I can see what I want to do. I want to get both boxes to XM. So XM on both boxes by pressing B, um, by pressing B M times. Get both boxes to XM. And now P is the smallest number that XM plus P is equal to XM. So press button B on box two until they match. And that will happen after exactly P presses. So count as you do that. Um, okay, so this, this um, experiment is much simpler because now we know XM, so we're, we're in a good position. We can get both boxes to XM and now start watching one of them go after that we know that it's going to repeat because xm is the first number that repeats and we know it's going to repeat the question is just how long does it take before it repeats um, so get, get both of them ready and then send one of them around the loop and we'll wait to see when it comes back okay um that's question seven and that's the end of maths 2019